Good morning, everyone. If you want to come up and we'll... <laughs> We're going to uh, draw for a free pass for next year's. Oh, you want me to draw? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Excellent. We'll get you the code and you can register tomorrow. No. How's everyone doing? Good. Everyone had a great week? Yeah. You got things you can uh, bring back to work? Good ideas, everything? Great. All right, let's do a warm uh, NEGO welcome. Emily Allen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for uh, choosing to delay your flights or choosing to delay your travel so um, you can learn how to put accessibility into action on social media. Uh, so my name is Emily Allen Lute. Um, I am now the Director of Digital Com Communication for the United States Naval Academy's Alumni Association and Foundation. Very, very long title. Uh, but I will tell you, so I started in May. So a lot of the examples um, that you all are going to see are actually from my time when I was in government with a few little nods um, to our friends over at the US Naval Academy. So without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I will caveat this. Um, this isn't gonna be your typical keynote where you kind of sit and take notes. Um, grab your phones and play along. Uh, a lot of the examples that I'm gonna show you, you can actually do in real time. All right, so why do I care so much about accessibility? Um, I'm a former news professional. Are there any other former news professionals in the audience? Nice, I can. <laughs> Washington Post shout out. Um, so I went to school, um, and see, already they're, they're trying to get a hold of me, go away. Um, I went to school for journalism, and um, very quickly I learned news wasn't for me. And so I spent about eight years with the state of Maryland. So I worked three years in emergency management, I worked three years in school safety, and I worked one year in housing. During that time, uh, I had the opportunity to work with some incredible public information officers and joint information centers, um, and I worked some national level emergencies and some state level emergencies. So um, the Baltimore civil unrest is actually me briefing our state emergency operations center, um, letting people know, um, you know what we're gonna be, what we're gonna be doing. Um, and of course, I was not prepared for any keynotes or any accessibility, anything, and so I basically went to the front of the podium and I said, any social media you share, just share it with me first, and you know, it was my, my first activation. Um, but yeah, so I've met with some really incredible people. I worked national of emergencies, um, went Ellicott City, which is the oldest city in Maryland when that flooded. Um, not once, but twice, um, I got to work with them too. And as I was working some of these emergencies, we had a school shooting, um, I noticed there was a theme. And that theme was that, for whatever reason, um, accessibility was an afterthought. And so we'd sit and we'd have these hot washes and they'd say, oh yeah, we need to make sure our stuff is accessible. We need to make sure our templates are accessible for the next time. Um, and it wasn't happening. There wasn't enough time for next time. And I said, no, we need to start to implement accessibility tools right here and right now. And that's when I met Cecilia Warren and her seeing eye dog Yale. So Cecilia and I um, kind of co-partner whenever we do presentations about accessibility. She brings her screen reader software in here. She shows everyone what she kind of sees on her side. Um, but one day, I had sent out a tweet on what I call my sunny sky days. For those of you who are familiar with emergency management, we have our stormy sky days when we're activated, and then we have our sunny sky days when everything's peachy keen and we just want people to prepare for the worst day of their life. Um, so I met Cecilia and she called me up and she said, hey, that, that information that you sent from FEMA, FEMA um, is not accessible to me on my screen reader technology that I'm using, and I was like, okay, what do, what do I do to make this better? And she said, well, I don't, I don't know if you can because Facebook doesn't have the tools to add alt text. And she's using all these really key jargon terms and I'm really lost. Uh, and I said to her, well, let's meet, let's talk, let's have a discussion. I wanna find out what are you seeing on your end and how we can build and improve it. Um, so that is Yale. Whenever we do presentations, Yale is our mascot. 
who doesn't like a dog. Um, so uh, before I continue, I want to make sure that everyone knows a lot of uh, social media companies, the giants that they are, meta, um, uh, they have come up with this idea that we can use AI to make things accessible. And I want to give you guys just a really brief example of why that isn't going to be the answer to our problems. So we have two images here, very, very similar, but there's definitely a difference. And so when I uploaded both of these images to Facebook just the other day, I got option A and option B. Um, now, you can try to decide for yourself if you think the description uh, for the first photo matches description A or description B, but overall, you can see that this really isn't giving um, a really good description of what this image is. Um, but I will tell you, uh, this is a photo of four of our alum who graduated from the US Naval Academy. They did a flyover on Saturday, and they got to meet with our new CEO, Jeff Webb. Uh, and our president as well. And so this was a really prominent photo. I wanted to make sure people knew this, so I went back and I edited the alt text, but I wanted you all to see that, hey, this is why AI won't always be the answer to our problem. So why should you care? Um, so according to the CDC, 61 million adults in the US live with a disability. Um, but that number could be skewed a bit, and here's why. Not everyone who has a disability knows they have one, and not everyone who has a disability wants to openly stand up and accept it, or stand up in front of people having to use assistive technology, whatever the case may be, um, because unfortunately there's a stigma that comes with saying, hey, I have a disability, I need to use assistive technology, I need to use you know, certain things to help me. Um, so when you break that down, that's one in four adults. So a really good example that I use with this um, is I have to wear glasses. When uh, 2020 threw everybody for a loop, right? Uh, and it threw my eyesight for a loop because I literally was sitting and staring at computer screens. I was in joint information centers. Um, and so I didn't even realize that me pulling my phone to and from my face like a crazy person was me having a sight disability. Um, and then when my husband caught me, hi honey, when my husband caught me pulling my phone away, he kept saying, you need glasses. I don't need glasses, I just need to make my font bigger. No, you really need glasses. Then when I finally came to the realization that I needed glasses, I didn't want to accept that I needed glasses because I didn't want to be that person, I'm a huge roller coaster enthusiast, um, I didn't want to be that person that has to have the straps to strap onto my glasses as I'm flipping upside down. And I kept telling him, like, no, that's you. You're the one with the glasses. You're the geek of the family. I'm the beauty, the beauty and the geek. This is how our relationship is. Um, so uh, he's probably going to watch this, and he's probably going to say, why didn't you wear your glasses? And that's just because I want to be right for once. Another reason for why you should care is, um, in government, your messages need to reach the broadest audience possible. Um, I heard just yesterday that 85% of the videos that are watched on, on Facebook specifically, even now that we have reels that are kind of replacing our videos, they're, they're with no sound. And I generally don't like to watch videos um, that have sound because maybe I'm sitting in a meeting and um, you know I'm spacing out a little bit and I want to know what's going on. And so I like to have closed captions. Um, it's actually true that adding captions to your video, this is according to Facebook, will increase your boost time by 12%, um, but the reason I like captions is because I actually understand what's happening, so it actually helps my comprehension as well, and it'll help your viewers' comprehension. It also helps for better search engine optimization, your better technical performance, better impression rate. I have many times not shared a video because it didn't have closed captioning, and so my mom, who is a daycare provider, she has a million things going on, and I know that she's not sitting and she's gonna watch a whole video, but it, for whatever reason, if it, there's closed captions, she seems to um, comprehend what's happening. But most importantly, it's gonna serve your whole community, um, which is why I like that meme there, do all the accessibility, get all the impressions. Another, another reason for why you should care. So when I was talking to Cecilia, she said, look, your social media audience is gonna be people who are fully capable, who don't have a disability or don't know they have a disability, um, but it also includes people who are gonna be visually disabled, low vision, deaf or hard of hearing, 
people who have motor functionality disabilities, non-native language speakers, cognitive disabilities, senior citizens, your underserved communities are really gonna benefit from accessible features, homeless, others with access and functional needs. Um, and then I added this one just yesterday. I thought about it and said, oh, our veterans. So they probably are following us, and so the way it works when you go to the U.S. Naval Academy, um, for four years, you learn how to be an officer in the Navy, and then you go off and you serve. Um, so they may get injured when they're off and, and at war or serving, um, and so when they come back, they're still following us, and we need to make sure that our message is accessible to them. All right, <clears throat> how do you get leadership to care? Well, one, it's the law. Um, so there's a bunch of different laws like the American with Disabilities Act, the Rehabilitation Act, but I encourage you to go back to your home states and look and see what your state laws are as well. Um, but the question is, well, do any of these laws apply to me? The answer is yes. Um, if you're a state or local government agency that's receiving funding from the federal government, then yes, you need to make sure your, your stuff is accessible. If you're an organization that's receiving funds from the federal government, educational entities, if you produce or broadcast or distribute video programs that can be viewed in the United States, manufacture hardware or software that can be displaying video programs, um, and if you produce content for any of the entities that I just listed um, and you receive federal funding, then you really should be accessible. So for whatever reason, whenever we go to our leaders and we say, well, so-and-so down the street's getting sued for X amount of dollars, for whatever reason, when you dangle the money carrot in front of your leaders, that's when they say, okay, yeah, we should, we should, we should do this. Another reason why, um, it makes them look good makes you look good, right? Leadership is always constantly making sure that they're staying um, you know, out of the infamous limelight and more in the famous limelight. Um, so for press conferences, this is a really good opportunity for people to say, you know, we care about our citizens, making sure that you have an uh, American Sign Language interpreter at your press conferences, that shows that you care. Um, but from the social side, giving your audience just a really quick sneak peek, and I'll explain how to do this in a minute, of what you're doing to ensure inclusivity um, is really, really important. So giving them that behind the scenes look of here's how we're making sure that our content is accessible um, will really make people feel like, oh wow, these guys really care about me and I'm so glad so-and-so is in that leadership position. I'm gonna vote for him again or her again or however they choose to identify. So some of the barriers, one of the things that I discovered as I was going down what I was calling the rabbit hole of accessibility at the time um, was I actually didn't know what accessible meant. So Cecilia told me, well, it's basically the absence of barriers or obstacles that are preventing your citizens with disabilities from getting full access to information or services. And we can talk about the physical disabilities, we can talk about the physical um, you know, changes to buildings and things like that. She's like, but really, you're not reaching your whole community with this tweet that you sent out. So then I did a little bit more investigation and then I found out I really need to be making sure that my information is able to have the ability to give people um, a, a task or gain information without needing assistance from others, right? So they shouldn't have to call me to say, what did you just send out? They need to be able to access it. Um, I ran into uh, an issue in government that I'm sure many of you run into and that was um, at one point in time, I had a leader who will remain nameless um, who said, well, we, we have our website and it's not 100% you know, accessible, but how about we just strip everything from, from that website that looked cool and had all the whistles and gadgets and we'll just give them a text version. And I looked at it, this person and I said, uh, no, separate is not equal. And I called Cecilia and I said, can we have a separate website? And she's like, no way, what is wrong with you? Um, and so I always have to kind of remind people that if that particular um, platform that you're using, if that's not accessible, we have to find other ways so that it does become accessible. But for websites, it was an easy answer. I could say, no, we can't do that. So I noticed that there were some staff limitations. I was a team of one at the time when I worked for the Emergency Management Agency. I was a team of one when I worked for the Center for School Safety. And I was a team of two when I worked for the Department of Housing. Um, and I discovered I can't do this by myself. I can't remediate all the documents. I can't remediate all the social media that we've posted. Um, I discovered the beauty of interns. 
Um, and I don't know how many of you have uh, interns, but I was tired of my intern going to get the coffee or sit in on this meeting for me. Um, I actually trained our interns to um, add closed captioning. I trained our interns to add alt text so that they could, one, have a really good experience with us and they can tout our name. Um, and they were always on social media too and they were sending out their fun stuff and I was making sure it was accessible. Um, but they had a, a, a bullet that they could put on their resume that would really make them stand out for future employers. Uh, the other thing that I noticed as I was getting deployed to all these different um, S SEOCs or State Emergency Operations Centers um, was training the joint information team before they even came in. So we would give them their really quick brief of like, here's the situation, here's your sit rep, we're meeting at this time. And then I'd take like 15 really quick minutes and I had a little handout that I gave them of here's your checklist to make sure when you're with us, you're being accessible. And I gave it to them quick and simple. Here's how you add alt text. If you're gonna do a video, here's how you add captions. And then that we were able to make sure we were on the forefront and no longer was accessibility an afterthought. Um, so then also I trained our staff on how to create external documents, especially if they're creating external documents and we're linking to those on social media. They'd create a really cool document, they'd upload it to the website, guarantee it was probably a PDF and it was not accessible. And so I'd say, I am not going to link to your piece until you ensure me that it's accessible because anything from social media to web to digital, we have control over, we're gonna make sure that's accessible. Um, and then I remind everyone, don't forget to fix your older files too. Um, for us in the joint information team, we had templates, we had general videos that we always sent out, hey, there's a snowstorm, making sure that those closed captions are right and appropriate. Um, and making sure that all of those images that we were constantly using all the time had image descriptions so that we could just essentially copy and paste it as opposed to having to rewrite it over and over and over again. Um, I even reached out to FEMA and I said, you have really great toolkits. However, can you add alt text to all these really cool infographics that you're sending out? And um, eventually we were able to have what I'm calling uh, come to Jesus moments where I explained to them, you know, hey, if this is a toolkit, make it really work. You're giving us more work when you send out this stuff. Please help us. So that's kind of the why you should care, how to get leadership to care, um, why I care. Um, but now the question I always get is, well, where the heck do I start? So I always say start simple, but start now, right? So by saying, we're gonna become accessible one day, we'll be fine, um, but, but we have to have conversation about it. We, we, we need to meet with leadership. We need to start now. Um, so start with your posts and your images. So with your images, make sure you're adding alt text or your image description, and there is a difference between the two. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, make sure your posts are people first, language inappropriate. Make sure you're using Pascal case or Camel case. I know the, the, the jury's out on what we're actually calling it, but I call it Pascal case um, on your hashtags. And minimize the use of emojis. And then once you have all of that figured out for right here and right now, because I know all of you are gonna get up and leave, and as soon as you walk out those doors, you're gonna be like, yeah, we're gonna add alt text to our photos. Um, then start to go back and figure out how far back you want to go to ensure that your, your social media is accessible. A lot of people say, well, how far should I go back? And that's really gonna depend on your audience because my audience is still looking at stuff from like 2015 and for whatever reason, sharing it. So I go back to those posts and I make sure that those posts are accessible because back in the day they weren't. Um, and then when it comes to videos, just make sure you have synchronized captions in them. So to improve your social media content, uh, like I said, describe your images, describe your GIFs, describe your stories as best you can. Um, add closed captions or audio transcriptions for those of you who have a podcast. Um, when you're using links in your posts, use link shorteners. I know USA uh, or go.usa.gov is unfortunately shut down. Um, so a lot of people are using Bitly now. So those free resources or even maybe thinking about investing in some of those. Um, let users know what they're about to click. Don't use things like, you know, click here or here's the link. Um, and, and be descriptive. Let people know what they're about to click on. Um, I'm in the process right now with me still being new and only starting in May. I'm going through all of our emails to make sure we say, the following link is a link for you to sign up for registration for the conference. Or, you know, giving a little bit more description than just click here to register. 
Um, so again, using Pascal case, good, uh, good example there. So Pascal case, for those of you who don't know, um, screen readers will actually read your um, hashtag as long as the um, first letter of, of each word is capitalized. Otherwise, it likes to read it as countdown to kickoff, and you can't really hear the distinction between each word. So um, for those who are not visually disabled, this is a lot easier to read, too, for, for people who um, you know, don't have disability. Um, and then test your content. Is there anybody here who tests their social media content already with screen reader technology? But you're going to? Okay. <laughs> um, so make sure to schedule time to review your content. This is a really good sunny sky day type of a thing. I actually have a reminder on my calendar to go through and, and test my content um, using my desktop or using my cell phone, and I'll show you guys how to do that in just a minute. Um, and then also talk, talk with your, your state partners and, and your, your federal partners and, and see what more can be, be done. Uh, things to avoid. So for the longest time, um, when you are trying to post a Facebook ad campaign, uh, it was really hard to add alt text to those images, especially if you're trying to schedule them out. Now I know that's changed a little bit, but for a lot of people, they're not seeing that change on that end. Um, in government, we love our acronyms so, 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 so much. Um, make sure to define what all of your acronyms are so that people who, you know, and this doesn't even have to go for uh, accessibility. When I worked um, for the state of Maryland, the governor's office actually told us, hey, don't be using acronyms because the common person or even visitors who come to our state aren't going to know who you are, DHCD. Department of Housing and Community Development is what we'll put in our press releases. Um, be mindful when you're sharing inaccessible content. So Twitter just released this year the ability to hover over top of an image, um, and you can actually see what that image description is. So before you share content, make sure it's accessible. Um, if it's not, you know, maybe reach out to the person who created the content to say, hey, this isn't accessible. Can you add alt text to it? Uh, I'd love to be able to share your message. Uh, flashing content, this is especially true for you know, your citizens who suffer from um, epilepsy. Um, make sure that you don't have those flashing things, especially now in Reels where everybody's trying to edit to music. Um, just today I was scrolling mindlessly and all of a sudden I saw something that was like white and black and blue and I was like, wow, for somebody who does not understand people use technology that are disabled, this could be something that could throw them into an epileptic seizure. Um, Auto-generated texts and captions will always be incorrect. Uh, always make sure you check those. Um, remember, you control the text of your alt text, so therefore you control the context, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. There's a lot of third-party social media management tools. Um, I'm not going to shout out any one in particular, um, but I can tell you uh, a really good example is they know that they need to be accessible. There have been people who have come to them and said, we're not going to you know, side with you or, or you know, sign a contract with you until you sign and, and make sure you tell us that it's accessible. Um, and then we also have third-party production companies. So how many people have the ability to go back to their RFP when they're trying to sign in a photographer or a videographer and you say, well, I, I really love this video. This is great. This is two hours long, but I need you to add closed captioning. Nobody wants to sit there and say, and especially your interns. Your interns will be energetic and they'll want to do that, but like after 30 minutes, they're going to be like, this is ridiculous. Um, so, you know, make sure when you're having those conversations, whether it be your RFPs or whatever, make sure that you have accessibility um, mentioned in there. Uh, and the important thing to remember is we know that social media is always changing because we, we hate meta whenever meta changes something. Um, but what I notice is that every time social media uh, changes, accessibility and the functionality of what used to be is no longer there. So keeping in mind that every time social media changes, there's probably an accessibility piece that changes as well. Um, things to avoid. Too many emojis or um, I know a lot of airline agencies like to make little airplanes out of emojis with emojis of airplanes. Um, and that gets to be really, really distracting to somebody who is, is using a screen reader. Uh, has anybody heard of SpongeBob speak? 
Oh, a few of you. Oh, that's great. Uh, so SpongeBob speak is kind of more of like a, like a sarcastic way of, of getting your message across. So if um, you know, I were to say, oh, I really like that shirt she's wearing, and somebody next to me goes like, oh, yeah, it's a real great shirt. That's kind of what sponge, SpongeBob speak is. Um, to a screen reader, they're going to read the capital letters as just the letters themselves, and then they're going to try to put the lowercase letters in as a word. So a screen reader might read this word SpongeBob speak as S P O N G B O B will speak, and so somebody who's reading a screen reader would not be able to decipher that. Um, a lot of people like to put emojis after their Twitter handles, like, "Hey, I'm currently at this conference airplane." We're having pizza tonight, pizza. You really don't need that um, because people are going to just try to figure out who's the person that's sending out this content uh, and, and fancy font. Screen readers have a really, really difficult time with fancy font. Um, so I want to give you an example. Um, <laughs> back in, I believe it was 2020, we were talking on social media about trends, and the trend of the red flag trend came up. Um, so for example here, when your toddler is silent, red flag, red flag. But to somebody who's reading a screen reader, this is what they're hearing. Your toddler is silent. Triangular flag on post. 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 Triangular flag on. You get the point. Um, so keeping in mind that just because the trend is really cool and you know, like, hey, like our, our organization can definitely do this trend, this is great. But for somebody who is using screen reader technology, they're going to be sitting here trying to figure out what just happened to my phone? Is, is it broken? Like what's, what's happening? So I talked about how to know if an image has alt text. So thankfully, we have Twitter who's come to the table and said, yep, boom, here you go. This is how you know that this you know, message or this picture is accessible. Not all social media platforms are willing to do that. So um, if you go ahead and you click on an image, and uh, you're going to right click, not left click. Uh, and then if you go ahead and look in the code, you can actually pull up the alt tag. Um, and so clearly, here I have set the example. Um, and I said, hey, this is a picture of Main Street area with cars parked alongside the road. Really, really brief description. Um, so that's how you can find out if the content you're sharing on Facebook or um, Instagram or whatever is accessible. So this is a resource for you all, um, but I encourage you to go back um, when you get home, Google people first language. Um, a lot of people, when they're trying to speak about um, an individual with a disability, they're not quite sure the best way to explain it, um, even when they're just talking to someone. It doesn't even have to be on social media. Um, the one that I see a lot is handicapped equipment, right? So this one right here, um, whoops. But obviously, you know, saying things like assistive devices, assistive technology, durable medical equipment, things like that. Um, so yeah, if you have an opportunity to go back, look at people first language and, and make sure that, you know, how you're talking to people, how you talk about people, um, you know, you can kind of practice what you preach and you can be the subject matter experts. OK, so let's talk about images. I think a lot of you probably kind of already know what alternative text is, but I do want to give you a, a couple of pieces to take away from here. So this is my dog, Titan. Um, I was told that your presentation kills uh, if you have dogs or babies. So I don't have babies for you all, but I have dogs. Um, so keeping in mind that alternative text is supposed to be basic, it's supposed to be simple, but it's the important info and getting that info out the door. Usually it's around uh, 125 characters, uh, and, but its sole purpose is to basically give you any text that appears on the image and basic details. Um, but the cool thing that I discovered is that an, if an image fails to load, alt text will appear in its place. Um, and search engines use alt text and consider it when determining your search engine ratings, which is cool. Um, so what I would do for alt text for this is I would say a dog with a toy ball. Nothing more really needs to be said. When it comes to image description, image description is a little bit more in detail. You're looking at mm, about 280 characters, give or take. Um, but it's not going to appear if the image doesn't load. Um, and it doesn't really do anything for search engine optimization. So for this image, I would say a brown and white dog located safe inside of a home stands on a gray carpet with a bandana around his neck. There's a ball to the background and to the left of him. And the reason I'm bringing up 
alt text and image description is because social media is still really, really, really new to this whole idea of accessibility, um, and they like to use it kind of interchangeably. So you'll hear me use it interchangeably only because the social media platforms use it interchangeably. Um, and a fun story is um, I was presenting at a conference, and Twitter had just come out with their alt text, which was great, and I wanted to kiss the floor they walked on. Um, but I went over and I had a conversation with Hootsuite, and I said to him, you know, hey, just so you know, your, your platform doesn't allow me to add alt text, so I'm not using it anymore. Um, and we had a conversation with their developers, and we were able to get them to add alt text. And then we went to Meta. And I said to Meta, I need to talk to your web developers. I need to talk to whomever. We need to make sure that we get alt text up there. And they're like, what, what the heck are you talking about? And I said, there are so many gaps that me and my colleague have identified, and I want to show you how we're teaching people to bridge the gap. And so we met with Facebook, and we showed them everything. And I said, well, where, where's your team from like your, your disabilities department or inclusivity department? And they didn't have one. And I said, OK, well, is there anyone here that has family members who you know, may be disabled, who may be using assistive technology? And the answer was no. Um, but thankfully today, I can tell you that because of that conversation, Facebook does have a group of people now whose sole purpose is to look at the accessibility of things. Now, I don't know if they're being included at the table where they decide to make big changes and they get to meet with Mr. Zuckerberg, um, but I do know that they have a group of people who I'm constantly reaching out to. Every time something changes, I immediately go, hey, did you check to make sure that your accessibility team was in on this? And nine times out of 10, the answer is, no, we did not get a chance to. Well, we're going to work on that. It's on the roadmap. So, um, you know, make sure that when you guys go back and people want to make changes to your websites or whatever, um, you say, is this accessible? So, another example I have here Alt Text, the Stone Arch Bridge in Minneapolis. Anybody here from Minnesota? What, what? I was actually proposed to on the Stone Arch Bridge. Um, so the Stone Arch Bridge in Minneapolis with the skyline, um, and then I would give an image description, a photograph of the Stone Arch Bridge taken at dusk. Minneapolis skyline is in the distance behind the bridge with city lights also lit. Um, so I like to think of the image description a little bit more as the story of the image, whereas the alt text is very simple, getting people to actually see, um, well, see what the picture is. So context matters, I mentioned that. All of these options, A, B, and C, will work for this image, um, but it's about the focus, right? So you decide when you have your image that you want to describe, you decide what the important part is that you want people to take away from it. So in option A, a brown and white dog located safe inside of a home stands on a gray carpet with a bandana around his neck. There is a red ball in the background to the left of him. Well, we're focusing on the safety of the dog, so this probably was gonna come from more of a preparedness message. Um, whereas option B, a dog with a toy ball, is a really quick description, so that would be used for alt text. And then option C, a small dog in a home looking at the camera, not paying attention to his favorite toy ball, which is behind him. We're focusing more on what the dog is doing, so this might be more of a pet preparedness piece. So how do you go about writing those photo descriptions or those alt texts? So fo focus on the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, the how. And for those of us who are former reporters, Ken, um, these are the questions that we always ask our, our, sub, our subject matter experts when we're interviewing them. And so that's what you want to do for this photo as well. Who is in the photo? What are they doing? Where is the photo being taken? What does the photo, how does it relate to the post? Any important text? And a lot of people are like, man, that is a lot of writing for me to do. So pro tip, uh, use your voice to text when you're using uh, the ability to describe your images. So. Um, you know, let's say you're on Instagram and you want to add alt text, just hit that button in the bottom corner with the little microphone and literally read into your phone what that image is so you can save some time. All right, let's talk about Twitter, my favorite. All right, um, so I want to give you an example of somebody who's using a screen reader, what it's going to sound like when there's no photo description added. Social networking folder, eight app, yeah. opening social networking folder, social Twitter. Double tap to open. Twitter. Emily Allen Lodge. She slash her. Check out pictures from today's visit. Image. 25 seconds ago. Actions available. So no description at all whatsoever. So now let's look at it. Social networking fold. Shush. Um, now let's look at it from a different perspective when I'll show you how you can add alt text to Twitter and then what that sounds like. 
So you go in, go into Twitter. You're going to find whatever photo you want to find. So I'm going to use this image right here. And I'm going to click on the image. And right there is the Alt Text button. It says plus Alt Text. Um, and so now I'm going to give a really brief description on what I'm seeing. So when I created this post, I wanted to show that our secretary, Ken Holt, has decided to leave the comfort of his office um, and see what the construction project updates were all about. So I didn't necessarily need to figure out the names of every single person in the photo, but I did want to focus on Secretary Holt. So I'm saying Secretary Holt and three other people standing outside of a construction site. Really simple, to the point, people get it. Now I can go back up in my context and I can let people know that Secretary Holt decided to stop by and check out the construction, and then my alt text describes a little bit more about what is happening in relation to the post. So we can skip ahead here a little bit. And so stuff like this for me happens on the fly all of the time. Um, so when we're on our phones, we're trying to do stuff in real time, there's Voice of the Twitter. ability header to photo. Alt text. Twitter, double tap, Twitter, header photo, button, image, items 1 to 3 of 49. Items 1 to 1 of 49. Emily Allen Lodge, she's profile photo. Emily Allen, Secretary Holt stopped by the construction site today to see how much progress is being made. Secretary Ken Holt and three other people standing outside of the construction site, image. Displays this image, full voice over off. She gets really annoying really quick, and my husband hates when I'm testing our, our social media. But um, that gives you an idea kind of of what people who are using screen readers are seeing and hearing. Now, I will tell you, when I met with Cecilia, and she unplugged her headphones, because usually uh, she'll have her iPad with her, um, and she's using headphones as she's trying to navigate documents and things like that. And you can change the speed of that speaker. But when she does it, she's so used to hearing it to the point where she has sped it up so fast that even I'm like, okay, you gotta slow her down. I cannot keep up. Um, so people who um, you know, are disabled, they're used to hearing that monotone voice all of the time. Um, and so they'll change it up every once in a while. Uh, now let's talk about <clears throat> Facebook. Um, and, I, and, I, and I send only shade to Facebook because they were late to the game and they always like to tout themselves as, as being the greatest and we're doing everything to ensure everything's accessible and, and I kind of just have to look through that through, uh, I guess, rose-colored glasses. Um, so when it comes to adding alt text to an image on Facebook, um, you can do it through, there's probably six different ways um, that you can go about adding you know, content to Facebook. Um, I'm using just this simple desktop way of doing it, but you know, if you're out in the field, so to speak, um, almost all of the apps that they have, Pages, Business Manager, all that stuff, now have the ability to add alt text. So what you're gonna do, you're gonna add a photo, you're gonna click that you wanna add the photo, and so I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna find some type of an image here. Let's use this one right here, perfect. Uh, now, I'm going to go ahead and click Edit in the upper left-hand corner. Click on Alt Text. But now see, it says maybe an image of one person, child, and standing, right? So I know that that's not what the context of this is. Um, you know, and I have people and photographers who will go out and they'll take pictures and they send it to me. Hey, go ahead and send this to social media. And I immediately write back and I say, Give me two to three sentences on what is happening in the picture so that I don't have to be the one to sit there. I can copy and paste it. Um, so I know what the narrative of this photo is. It's, it's a child and her son, and they're happy that they closed on a house, so they're happy and, and they're embracing. Um, and so now I can go back up and I can add the context, um, letting people know home and ownership is possible, um, you know, and, and give them a bit more of a story within the context itself. All right, so how can you improve the accessibility on Facebook? Obviously, add alternative text. Facebook's uh, auto-generated alternative text we've already seen in many examples um, can be incorrect. Always go back and check. And remember, you control the alternative text, so therefore you control the narrative. You control the context. Um, and again, like I said, beware of those third-party apps and beware of GIFs. A lot of people lately have been using GIFs on Facebook. Now on Twitter, you can go back and you can add alt text to your GIFs, which is fantastic. Um, you know, another nod to Twitter. 
Um, but what you can do is you can actually, you know, come up with your context in your post and then just under that write image description or GIF description and give a really brief description of, of that particular GIF. Um, the other thing that you can do too, if you notice sometimes when you're adding hyperlinks, it will give you like a really quick image of what the article is you want people to click on. You can do the exact same thing there too. Um, Facebook has yet to say, yes, we, we need to give you an option to add alt text, but they look at that as a hyperlink and so it blows their mind when they're like, whoa, there's images that get included to this. Um, so you, know, you guys can kind of take the initiative and add your own image description to that so people know what they're clicking on. So let's talk Instagram, LinkedIn, and a couple more. Um, when adding a photo to Instagram, this one is a really heavy mobile app, so I'm gonna show you the mobile version of how to do it. Um, but again, you can use Facebook Creator Studio, um, and you can go and you, you can add alt text in a very similar manner. Um, the other thing you'll notice too is I have um, everything in my examples, they're all in dark mode. Um, and I have every single app that I can on my phone to be in dark mode because we are constantly looking at blue light from white backgrounds. Um, also, that's why I decided to kind of be the rebel of the group and not use the template uh, that was supplied to us. So this is probably new for you, but I thought you guys probably want to rest on having white light hit, or blue light hit your eyes as well. Um, so what you'll do is you'll go ahead, you'll go to advanced settings, you'll click on accessibility, and you'll click add alt text. It is hidden, uh, especially if you have your phone in dark mode. It's in, in gray on gray, essentially. Um, and now if you have your Facebook and your Instagram and your Twitter all kind of linked together, your alt text from Instagram will also transfer over to Facebook and to Twitter. Um, so there's my puppy, Lando Calrissian Jameson Loot, when he is in trouble. Um, chewing on a plastic toy hammer. Now when it comes to LinkedIn, um, I've noticed that you have the ability to add alt text, which is fantastic, but the um, company is only allowing us for 300 characters, not 300 words, but 300 characters. Uh, and for a lot of people, that's just not enough. Um, so the same thing kind of applies. You can go ahead and say image description and give yourself a bit more. You have about 600 characters to play with as opposed to the, the 300. Uh, and just last week, uh, I found out that um, you can now add alt text on mobile on LinkedIn, which is fantastic. That's something that I've been asking for for a really, really long time, and it looks like somebody over there um, found the ability to uh, implement what I was able to ask for. So that's kind of an example down below there on what you would do for image description, so a screen reader would, would read that. All right, stories. This happened, I want to say, two or three weeks ago. So stories at first were not fully accessible, um, but it looks like Facebook is working on it. And Facebook stories specifically, which is kind of strange because not many people are doing Facebook stories. They're using more of the LinkedIn, or excuse me, not the LinkedIn stories. Those got axed with fleets. Rest in peace, fleets. Um, but Instagram stories. So Facebook stories, now if you put text on top of it, um, it will actually read it. So if you click that little icon that has the speech bubble and the speaker on there, it will actually say, this good boy needs more gifts and pets. So if anybody would like to donate gifts or pets to him, he would appreciate it. Um, but it doesn't add alt text to the image. Uh, so what you may need to do is go ahead and type in whatever you want the content to be, uh, but then down below put in an image description so people know what, what they are seeing and then it will read all of that text. And like I said, Instagram stories can't be read yet, yet, um, or there's no alt text. So the fix for that is I always tell people to post your story and then post it in the feed to kind of um, mitigate that gap. Um, and then for the video, they're doing better at adding captions, but I always tell people provide captions because burnt in captions, and we'll talk about those in a minute, but burnt in captions can't be read by screen reader technology. So I tell people provide the captions, but then also provide a link to the transcript. So um, the, the wonderful Morgan that was here from the FBI said that they actually have some type of a service that does their transcriptions for their podcast. So this is a really good opportunity for you as well if you're thinking about a podcast. So let's talk graphics. So this goes more into the branding side. Um, you know, one of the things I encourage you guys to do as we will go through some of these examples, but um, when, you're, when you go back, see if you have an alternative template that is in dark mode so that your staff has 
you know, a couple of options to kind of play from where you can still brand it properly, but it'll, you know, be a bit of a, a break on the eyes. Um, maybe it's just me and taking all of those public information courses through FEMA and it was literally the same blue text with the same font in the same background. Um, so this might help to, to kind of break up that monotony. So when di designing graphics for social media, keep in mind simple is best, less text the better. And what I always tell people is get to the call to action. Why are you posting this? Tell me what you want from me. Uh, make sure that your text is a sans serif font. Use larger font sizes. Uh, use simple and non-busy backgrounds. Your images, make sure they're crisp and they're in focus. I get a lot of images when I was working for the state. I got a lot of images of blurry objects and I was like, no, 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 no. I'm not posting this on social media. Go back, take a picture, try again. Uh, make sure they're properly colored. Uh, a lot of people would send me unbalanced pictures. It was a little crazy and they're like, do something with it. And I'm like, no, you own the content, you help me. Uh, and then also make sure that your color contrast ratio um, is, is appropriate, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so now as I kind of list some of those things, go back to your branding guides and make sure that your branding is accessible. So how many of you get flyers from staff that they've created um, and they want you to share it on social media for them? Yeah, because some like overnight they, they, they got Canva and now everybody's a graphic designer. Um, so this is more of a dramatic thing that I kind of played around with, but a lot of the graphics I would get at the state, somebody would just take the initiative and take a screenshot and say, you can share this on social. And my immediate answer was no, but here's what I have to do. Um, so as you can see, we have a really busy background. We have a lot of different font colors and choices, and it's just, it's not gonna work. Um, so this is how I'm changing it. I'm giving it a quick call to action. You're invited to Lando's first birthday party um, where there will be cake for everyone, including him. Um, and I'm giving it a solid background. So one of the things that I'm trying to get my team currently to keep in mind is we need to stop posting flyers on social media. Um, create an event, right? That's why Facebook has events. You know, make it its own separate piece so that you can add pieces to it. Um, and then the other piece is a lot of what is being covered in the white text that I'm sure you all can see so well, um, you can add that information to the content itself. And like I said, less text and less graphics is better, but it's also less that you have to add to your alt text. Press releases. Everybody likes to take a picture of their press release and think that people are clicking on it and they're actually reading it. Uh, newsflash, they're not. They just see that it's a press release and they go, okay, well, I'm gonna go find the video and watch that instead. Um, so one of the things that I did at the Department of Housing was I would get a quote from our secretary. I would either pull it directly from the press release um, or if I was really feeling ambitious, I would go and I'd say, hey, let's give our social media audience another piece that they can't get from their press release. Um, so that was kind of how we went around it. But a lot of times press releases are coming out because there's a call to action. They want somebody to do something. Um, so that's what I would put in quotes. And then I'd say, okay, here's a link. It's a link that's shortened um, that's gonna go to your press release. Okay, so for those that don't know, sans serif font um, is gonna be easier for people to read. So things like Helvetica, Verd Verdana, Ariel, Avant-Garde, Geneva, all of those. Um, those are your sans serif fonts, you wanna stick with those. I know in government we love Times New Roman and we love our serif fonts. Um, again, go back to those branding guides, make sure that you have a second font that you can use that is accessible and then kind of push your team to say, hey, this is also part of the branding guide, let's make sure you know, we incorporate this too. So I taught color contrast. Um, this is a big convoluted way of using what I'm calling the pass or fail method. Um, I don't know enough to say, yeah, I can talk to you today about WCAG, um, but there's a certain ratio for AA compliance, AAA compliance. I'm sure there'll be quadruple A compliance later on. Um, but I'm gonna give you a free tool that's easy to use um, that we can use to figure out if people who are colorblind are gonna be able to access our information. Um, so this is your resource alert. Uh, for those of you who like to take pictures of slides, please feel free. Um, if you use Google, I know many of us do, um, there is a, a plugin called the Accessible Color Picker. Um, and it's just a little plugin that you put in there and what you do is you click on your foreground and you click on your background and you find out if 
you know, if you're compliant or not. So for this particular example, this does not pass uh, compliance. And you can see that there it says 1.62, it's red, it does not pass. So I am going to go back to my graphic designer and say this isn't gonna work for people who are colorblind. But here's a good example of what it should look like. Um, we're still able to stay with the branding, we just need to switch things up a little bit, um, but obviously double A, 4.82, that's our compliance. And that's really what you're looking for, is making sure that you, you know, have the, the approval. Another example here of a flyer, just trying to remind people, if you learn anything today, please don't post flyers on social media, it's driving everyone nuts. Um, but so again, get to the call to action, if there's like a really prominent person that needs to be mentioned, join Mayor Ellington for the fifth annual Christmas tree lighting. And if you need to put the when or the where, you can put that on there too. But all of that other stuff that there's gonna be chocolate and hot cider and all that stuff, you can put that either in the invite or you can put that in the event or you can put that in the context. All right, let's talk videos. This is the future of social media. So everybody likes to talk about captions. They always say, I want to burn in captions. That's what open captions are. So there's a couple of caption things here. There's closed captions, there's open captions, and then there's cart, which is communication access in real time. With closed captions, viewers have the ability to opt in to display those captions. They are generally read by assistive technology, and they're generally posted after the video has already been recorded. Um, with open captions or burned in captions, those are always displayed. A viewer cannot turn those off. Um, and depending on the file, they can't always be read by assistive technology. Uh, and again, those are added after. And then there's cart captions. Um, viewers can opt in to display those. They can generally be read by assistive technology, but those are the captions that you see people typing during the news channel if you ever switch your captioning on during the news. Um, that people are typing essentially in real time. So when it comes to captions, keeping in mind that they're the text equivalent to all of the audio, um, they are required by federal law. It displays all the dialogue and audio as text only. So that includes things like background signs, like your doorbell, your dog barking, your soft music playing, all of that stuff. And like I said, it can be turned on or off. But what I love is that they're text-based files, so therefore they're searchable, and it's a really good return on your SOE. And one of the things that a lot of people say is, I need to turn on the subtitles. No, you need to turn on the captions. Subtitles are meant for language translation. Captions are meant for people with disabilities. So let's talk about compliance. Um, so generally, captions are one to three lines of text. They're on screen for about three to seven seconds, you wanna make sure people have time to actually read what they're displaying, but then kind of comprehend it a little bit too. Um, so what I like to do is make sure that um, it stays on there long enough for me to read it at least twice very quickly. They're synchronized with the audio and the on-screen images, so as soon as the person says the dog, it actually pops up the dog, it's not too soon, it's not too late, it's synchronized perfectly. Um, you wanna make sure that you don't have more than 32 characters per line if you can, because nobody wants to continue to read this black bar with white text all the way across the screen. Um, you're gonna use sentence case with them, so use upper and lower case letters. Pixel size is gonna vary according to the resolution of the video, uh, and then also make sure that you're not covering essential um, visual elements within the video. So you kinda of have to change how you film a little bit. You, as you're filming, you have to think, okay, and then down below is where we'll have the caption, so I actually need to move my shot up a bit, or I need to move my shot down a bit. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm working with our current videographer um, over at the U.S. Naval Academy's Alumni Association and Foundation. So for social media compliance, however, most social media platforms require a .srt file, uh, and that's kind of an example of what an SRT file looks like. Cecilia actually um, showed me that she could manipulate an SRT file, which blew my mind. Um, but basically that SRT file gives a start and a stop time to ensure that the captioning is gonna be absolutely perfectly lined up to the very last video frame. Not even the last second of the video, but the last video frame. So it's very, very detailed. Um, and another part that I forgot to mention here is Facebook specifically has a certain way that you're supposed to actually label your captioning file. It's like, we'll see it in a minute, but it's like captions.en underscore SRT or something like that. So um, make sure that you label those names absolutely um, 
appropriately. Otherwise, you're going to get really frustrated and uh, get very frustrated with Facebook. So when it comes to actually knowing how to caption, this is your captioning syntax, another resource alert for you all. Uh, make sure, again, you're using sans serif font. Your line breaks and your caption breaks should follow the natural rhythm of how you speak. So if line one says, John and Jane Smith had a fight on the second line, that's not how we would normally talk. We would probably say, John and Jane Smith had a fight. Um, sound effects, I see a lot of people like to put it in um, italicized font or lowercase font. Um, it should be capital letters and then brackets around it. Um, and you can look this up too on, online if you um, forget. Speaker identification, uh, a lot of people will just put you know, the name of the person or person one with like a dash or whatever, but it's really all capital letters on the speaker with a colon and then whatever they're saying. And you can see I'm adding things like the commas and the periods because automatic captioning um, that's generated by Facebook or YouTube is not gonna add those pieces for us all the time. When it comes to numbers, make sure you write out numbers one through 12. Um, and when it comes to other considerations for us specifically in government, um, I can always tell when somebody is using auto-generated captions because the word dot will actually appear, uh, and so the ums, the ahs, and the ers. So make sure you go back and you write that out the way you would actually fill out a URL field. Um, and same thing with move, removing those ums and ahs and ers. If you have a speaker who tends to use those words, it is okay for you to actually pull those out as long as you're not changing uh, the meaning of, of, that, of that message. So uh, a lot of people in Reels and in TikTok and in all of the other ones that I'm sure have yet to grace our presence, um, they like to use that burned in captions feature. And like I said, that's not uh, accessible to screen reader technology. So there's a couple of things that you can actually do. Um, you can upload the video, you can put in those burnt in captions so that you can increase your viewer impression rate, um, but then also include a video transcript. Sometimes you can say, you know, transcript in the bio, and then you can have people use, um, we use Linktree, uh, and then you can have a separate space on your website where you can actually have all of your, your video transcriptions. Um, I've seen some people, they'll use the uh, link sticker and they'll click the link sticker which will lead them to the transcript but then they'll announce click the link so that people know hey there's a link at the bottom if you want to read the transcript. Another resource for you all um, so if you use Microsoft Word and you're using the online version you can actually dictate in real time or if you pay for the premium feature you can actually upload an audio file and it will give you a transcription and it does a pretty good job with sentence structure as well um, so that's really cool, so Google for the win. Um, and then for Google Docs, you can actually start a new document, click on tools, click on voice typing, and then play your video, and then it will actually transcribe everything for you right there in real time, and then you can go back and make those edits uh, and make those changes as well. All right, so I'm a huge Star Wars fan. If you can't tell, my dog's name is Lando. Um, and the one thing I want you guys to take away from this is do not publish anything that's auto-generated. It is a trap, like Admiral Akbar says. Um, it's not always gonna be correct. It's not gonna have punctuation if you're talking captions. It's not gonna know how to um, define what the acronym is for your, your agency. So make sure you go back and you make those changes. So I use YouTube Studio um, because it's free, and when I was working in the government, we just didn't have money, so we were trying to get as many free tools and resources as we could. Um, but I know there's video and movie production software that also will let you create uh, SRT file as well. So now I just want to give you um, kind of a really brief example about captioning um, for social media. So like I said, I use YouTube Studio. Um, so I uploaded a video prior to this. I gave it about 30 minutes or so um, to have YouTube actually auto-generate those captions for me so it's less work. I don't have to sit there and type everything like we used to do. Um, so if you click on subtitles, you're going to go into YouTube's studio, um, which is in the drop-down, and you're going to go and you click on duplicate and edit. And so here is um, my transcribed audio. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go in, I'm going to put who the announcer is, formatting it properly, and I'm just gonna make this read like it's supposed to, proper sentence structure, capitalization, periods, punctuation, all of that stuff. 
Um, and so this is actually for a, a program that is uh, housing assistance. Uh, we had a lot of people in Maryland too, unfortunately, were losing their homes due to COVID-19. So we did a really quick PSA. And um, one of the things that people always say to us is, can you just upload this video really quick? It should only take like 30 seconds, right? And I'm like, no, we actually have to make sure that it's accessible. So I'm always talking to leadership when I'm in these roles to say, for you, it's probably very simple because you just see me upload the video and that's the end of it and here's the link and you move on with your life. But I make sure to tell them in my timeline how long it's gonna take for me to ensure that it's accessible. So this, you know, right now it's not taking me too long but I always give myself some wiggle room to go back to make edits, to watch the video, to make sure the captions display at the right time. Um, so that's kind of you know, the direction that we, that we go. So you'll go ahead, you'll hit publish, and now you'll see two different lines. So there's English, these are my captions here. It says published by creator. And now if I click on the three dots, I will have the ability to click on download, and then it'll ask me how I would like to download it, and I would like to download it as a SRT file. Uh, and then I'm gonna confirm that I'm okay downloading this from this website, I trust this website. All right, so there they go. And now I want to upload these to Facebook. So I'm in Creator Studio right now. I'm gonna click Upload Video. Just need a single video here. I'm gonna pull that exact same video that's up on YouTube. I'm gonna click Open. Tell it what page, I run many pages. Um, and so there's a couple options here. So I can give it a title and I can give it a description. But for a while there, Facebook wasn't really allowing for captions to be changed and switched out on their end. They would just automatically generate them for you and it was like, tough luck, this is what it's gonna be unless you have an SRT file, which is why we use the YouTube version. Uh, but now Facebook has the ability where you can actually go in and you can fix all the captions very similar to the way that you did it on YouTube. So you see me kind of going through there and you can see how they're using their SRT file with all of those numbers. You can actually adjust the time if you want it to appear a little bit sooner um, or you can go ahead and upload it. So it's captions.en underscore us dot SRT. And I would actually tell you guys, go ahead and create that, those SRT versions because you're gonna wanna use those for your other social media platforms, whereas you can't necessarily download it from Facebook, but you can from YouTube. And then we'll go ahead and we'll click publish and then we're off to the races. Um, but the beauty of that SRT file that I had downloaded is now I can use it on Twitter. So I'll show you how we do it on Twitter. Go ahead, click on the little media link there and then there's our captions and our video and we're all set. So we'll click edit in the upper right hand corner and we're gonna upload our captions and it even says you need an SRT file. And I just use the same one that I use um, with everything else. Okay. All right, make sure, come on, there we go. Um, so now I wanna show you a lot of people um, wrote to Facebook and they said, hey, we wanna make sure that you know, we're streaming all of our stuff live. We wanna have captions in real time. And now Facebook has done that. Now I will tell you, it's not gonna be in sentence case. There will probably be mistakes, but after your video goes out live, make sure you go back and you edit those captions. But here's how you can go ahead and you can add live captions to your Facebook live videos. So you're gonna click the go live. Again, you're in Creator Studio. And you wanna click on the page that you're in charge of. Where it says go live, you're gonna click, yep, I wanna go live. Over on the left-hand side, you'll click on settings and scroll down to viewer, because we want our viewer, and you're just gonna hit that little toggle switch, and that will um, appear. And you'll be able to have uh, captioning as close to real time as, as, as you can. All right, I talked about testing your content. Um, so for those of you who are using um, Macs or iPhones, this is actually really simple. You go into settings, you click on accessibility, and you switch the little toggle switch. I will warn you, when Cecilia showed me how to do this, <laughs> um, I didn't know how to use my phone because the, the functionality of how I use my phone changed. So you're actually gonna double tap on things in order to open them or access them. And you're using three fingers to swipe up or swipe down or swipe across. 
Um, this PC that I'm using right now has built-in accessibility tools and voiceover tools, so you can look into that. Um, and then there's also free screen reader software. Um, NAVDA is one of them where you can download it. Um, and then for those of you who have all of the monies, um, you can use a little bit more of advanced software like JAWS. <clears throat> All right, the one last thing I wanted to tell you guys is I've never really had an opportunity um, to kind of share my personal story on why this is important to me. Um, and so I'm very grateful that I have this opportunity. So my grandmother, who lives in Wisconsin, for those of you who heard the twang in my voice, yes, I'm from Wisconsin. <clears throat> my grandmother suffers from monocular degeneration. And so every day she's slowly losing her eyesight. And so every single time when I talk to someone, and they say, I don't have time to make this accessible. This is going to take too much. I don't have the money. I don't have the resources. The very first thing that comes to my mind is her, because I wonder how are people like her going to be able to access this information. My grandma's a very pride, prideful person. She doesn't like to ask for help. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with her eyesight. It just needs to be size 500 font, and everything will be fine. Um, so keep in mind when you say, well, we don't really have anyone in our community that's disabled. There probably is. Um, so I want to thank you so much. I do have a resources list of a bunch of different links that give you more information. So um, that's my email right there. I have business cards, a few, a few business cards, because I'm still new, so they gave me some trial business cards, I guess, um, if you want any more information. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, so I know this is, it's a new uh, social media channel, but we do hear a lot about TikTok, and I wonder if there's any accessibility features at all for TikTok. So actually, I was pretty impressed when TikTok came out, um, oh, because cool. there is um, a lot of voiceover features. I, I'm sure you all hear the voices that they're, they're adding to it. Um, but one of the things, I have a friend of mine who lives in Minneapolis, who's a huge TikTok component. He's won awards for all the stuff that he's done. Um, and he's even come to me and said, like, how do I make this more accessible? And what do I do? And, and so um, one of the things that I kind of told him is, you know, make sure you have a link that people can link to if you have a transcript. Um, if there are certain images that you want people to pay attention to, make sure that you give a quick little image description to that. Um, I know whenever there's a picture, there's not really alt text for it. You could probably tell the screen reader, hey, you know, this is what the image is, but if you have music or something like that behind it, they're probably going to get in the way. Um, so having just like a separate space just on your web page that's kind of a link will probably help, you know, kind of bridge, bridge that gap. But again, as social media continues to evolve, people think of accessibility kind of as, as the last step. So does that answer your question a little bit? Okay, perfect. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so you talked about event-based flyers. What about yes. informational flyers? Um, so you know, if we're putting up a flyer about maybe a process or just information about a certain topic, um, and that content is also in the area of the post, mm -hmm. does that information still need to be in the alt text, or can you just say a flyer about X, Y, Z and not be as descriptive? You're from the federal government, aren't you? I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <laughs> well, and we, I had a, a moment to briefly talk with you, I think, about this just a little bit yesterday, too, and I kind of heard the struggle that the federal government is doing. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of different ways that you could do that. You could, you know, very quickly say this is a flyer about X, Y, Z, A, B, and C. Click the shortened URL to get you to read the full entire context. I also know in federal government, y'all really, really love your infographics as well. <laughs> and a lot of people have said, like, we need to post this entire infographic. Um, so breaking it down into pieces, I think, really helps. So, you know, what is the main piece you want people to take away from page one? What is the main piece you want people to take away from page two? Um, creating little graphics like that, that kind of, the call to action for them is to, hey, I really need you to read this entire document, which I know you and you've already made it accessible, um, is kind of the way that I would bridge that. Does that kind of help somewhat? Do, do all you get like informational graphics and people are like, yeah, post everything and it's like pages long? 
So what I like to do is, like the cheap way, I will take a screenshot of it, and then I will make sure that it's still readable, and I will break it into pieces so that I have alt text for each individual piece. It drives people nuts because they're like, no, we want the whole entire thing. But if you push back and you say, well, it's not accessible, then they're like, oh, okay, yeah, maybe I, maybe I should really let you, the subject matter expert, do the experting. <laughs> I know, it's, it's, it's a wild dream. <laughs> so just, I'm over here. Oh, so just yes. as, a, yeah, there's, like, where's the voice coming yeah, from? Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, just as an affirmation, I think this is a great capstone for the whole week. There have been, oh, uh, like, when I first looked at the agenda, like, almost every time slot, there was some session dealing with accessibility, which it's very timely. Um, just as a tie into the question, there's a great session yesterday, I think it was, um, talking about how to do tagged PDFs. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're looking at that piece, and what I love about accessibility is we look at it, I'm just a web developer, right? I'm just building websites. Um, but everything's next level. So you're talking right. social media, tag PDFs. So it's like, ooh, now it's not just about the alt text on the pretty picture on my web page. Mm -hmm. um, so I appreciate the tools. This is more affirmation than question. Mm -hmm. The only tool I didn't hear mentioned at all this week, and I might have just missed the cool session, is webaim.org. Um, that's W-E-B-A-I-M.org. Mm -hmm. They have a contrast checker they that do. gives you the classification. Yep. And they have an amazing tool called Wave. Mm -hmm. You literally can dump the URL of your website into Wave. And for those of us that don't have the perspective of a screen reader first perspective on the web, it gives us a visual cue of like, these are the things you need to be concerned about. Here's what's working on your page. And it's not like the be all and end all, like Wave is sort of step one of bringing your website accessible. Um, but I just thought it would be worth mentioning sort of 101. So if you're not yeah. aware of webaim.org, and there's little tools at the very bottom, it's almost in the footer, you gotta check it out. But you can just drop your URL in there and it'll tell you a uh, really good overview of what's good. So thank you for a great presentation. I think it was the perfect capstone for the, thank you. For the week. Thank you, yeah. We, uh, we used WebAIM, I believe, for um, one of the sites that I was developing. Um, and of course, I could go down the rabbit hole for web, um, but I was asked here to do only social. So Jennifer, I promise I'm keeping it, keeping it tight. <laughs> um, but yes, we use WebAIM. And what I noticed um, with those types of tools, especially if they reach out to you and they're like, we've scanned your entire site and here's everything. Reach out to us and we'll make this better for you. Um, is for them, it's a check mark in a box. So I tested their little theory of making sure that my stuff was accessible. So yeah, maybe I put a space inside of the alt text field and it automatically comes up that like, hey, you've already added content. Well, no, I, I didn't. You, you were looking at the code to make sure that the code ensured that there was something there. Again, we really control what our audience and what our community is going to see and, and hear. So, um, you know, when people say, I, I, I just don't have time for it, I encourage them, I think you do, you just need to set time aside. Um, and when if you put accessibility in the forefront and you build your brand around accessibility and you build your message around accessibility and your tools and things like that, it's so much easier to get more people on board because you've, you know, you've already started, it's part of your process. It's when it's an afterthought that we really start to struggle. Thank you for that, by the way. Um, hi, uh, hi, I was just wondering is, at your level, are they looking to move to WCAG 2.1 uh, or 2.2 as the WCAG standards continue to evolve? So when I worked for the state, um, again, with me being in my new role, I can't answer that question yet. Uh, maybe next year, I will. See you in Indy. Um, but when I was working for the state of Maryland, we were actually working on getting to WCAG 2.0 um, and 2.2. Um, and then we heard, so fun story, the, um, Maryland Department of Education actually got hit with a lawsuit on their website, um, and that's what kind of lit the fire under their um, behinds, so to speak, um, to start to make sure that their website was accessible, and they actually created a department that was meant to sit and go through everything, and that's when we learned about WCAG 2.0, that's when we learned about um, the future of video and how eventually we will actually have to give image descriptions within video when essentially, I guess, WCAG 3.0 uh, comes out. But yeah, they're already looking at that um, ahead of time. And you know, I was talking to Ken about this yesterday. By the time that everybody gets up to the new standard, we're already behind. 
And so we have to be constantly be looking at, okay, but you know, this might not work in the future. What are we going to do to fix that? And uh, otherwise, we're going to be chase, chasing our tails and trying to figure out what's the next thing. We don't have time for this, you know, and, and we're going to be left behind. I'm John Northup from WebAIM, and I appreciate the shout out. And I'm, I've, 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 I've got your five. I've got your five bucks for after the <laughs> session this morning. But if, if anybody has questions on services or tools or how to use Way better, I'm right here. So. <laughs> And let me caveat that to say, WebAven is not one of them. They actually did look through and make sure that our alt text was in the right place. So yes, I highly, highly, highly suggest using WebAim. And I actually um, use WebAim as references in my other presentations as well. So thank you for having a, a really good tool. Go, Jason, go. Go, Jason, go. 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 <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. So earlier in the presentation, you <laughs> mentioned that shortening URLs, you do that to make it more accessible. Mm -hmm. is that, why is that? Because to me, it seems like it would be the opposite in a sense, because when you shorten it, it's just a random bunch of letters and numbers and that sort of thing. But sure. if you actually keep the actual URL, there's some context to it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I'm just curious why that would be. So for government for us specifically, and I'll give you an example. When I worked for the Department of Housing, um, we had really, really, really long URLs. Now think about somebody who's using a screen reader and it reads out that URL, http colon slash slash www.departmentofhousing.com slash hpbh54675962, <laughs> right? So what I tell them is the following link is you know, I'll just say like the plan for evacuation for like a hurricane route or something like that so that they know the shortened URL that they're going to is that otherwise they're hearing the entirety of that entire link. And for a lot of people, they're like, I just need to know it's a link. So that's why we always say using those shortened URLs. And I will say at one point in time, I don't know if Facebook's doing it anymore, but Facebook was creating their own shortened URLs, and then LinkedIn was creating their own shortened URLs, and so on and so forth. And I don't necessarily know if they're still doing that or not. I know LinkedIn does, because um, that's how we're actually able to track like our metrics and things like that. But that's kind of the reason why we, we do those shortened URLs. I got you. Another question, too, yeah. about you mentioned descriptions. Mm -hmm. So obviously, as far as five-way compliance, you need to use the alt tag. Mm -hmm. um, is it worth it to do descriptions in the sense that, by default, would screen readers actually pick it up? You know, I'm sure they're picking up the alt tag. Right. That's a good question. Um, the way I always look at it, too, is there's the law of what you should do, but then I also look at it from the sense of what would I want my entire community to do and how do I want to include them on my story. Um, you know, one of the things a lot of people say is, well, we'll, we'll just give a really brief description about this. And they, they'll figure it out. But if I was a blind user, I would really want to know what's happening in this and why it's, why it's important. Um, you know, so I don't know if that answers your question directly, but it might give you a, a better sense of kind of what the end user might be looking for. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, welcome back. Hey, uh, yeah, so I really love the presentation and all this. I'm definitely going to bring it back to the rest of my team. So the rest of my team doesn't really, I don't know what happens at their conferences, but accessibility just doesn't come up for them. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know why. So when I go back and I've got all this, like, hey, guys, you know, I've got all these new steps to add on to your process to oh, make yeah. your work longer. <laughs> uh, they're going to be so excited and so on board, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, any advice for how I can kind of sell them on it? Because it's just, I'm just adding to their workload. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important and I just want to figure out like how I can explain it to them so that they'll like actually, because I got like one guy, mm -hmm. our video guy, he's um, pretty old school. Mm -hmm. He's good at what he does, but I I had to talk to him for ages about captions at all. Mm -hmm. And he only does it for the big videos. You right. know what I mean? Yep. So like I just like any helpful hints on how I can sell this for them. Well, my first one that I always do is, oh, it's the law. We actually <laughs> do have to do this. 
Um, and then they say, well, then prove it. Um, and it doesn't take much to look and see how much Domino's got sued for, um, not just for social media accessibility, but their, their website was actually not accessible to somebody who really wanted to order a pizza. Um, thankfully, I can't you know, point, pinpoint anything, at least nothing off the top of my head, but it's something I'm keeping my Google alerts out for, is I can't find any company that's actually been sued for accessible um, social media. What I caveat that, though, is that more people are coming to your social media than they probably are your website nowadays. Um, so I think it's going to only be a matter of time before we start to see, um, I mean, there's a whole group of people who will remain nameless um, whose sole job is whenever there's an emergency that's happening and occurring, um, they will, in the middle of your chaos, say, hey, did you know your stuff's not accessible? We're going to sue you for this, this, and this. Well, my, my, my whole entire city is burning down. Can you just wait or we're you know, under six feet of water? Can you hold off on this? And, and they won't because... That's what's causing national attention. That's what's, you know, so you could, you could caveat it with that. Um, the other piece that I would say, too, is don't overwhelm them by saying, we're going to do captions, we're going to do alt text, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and this. Start really, really simple with them and say, hey, um, I know that we're going to post like three or four photos. Can we just make sure that we reach our entire community that we serve to ensure that we add those alt text pieces to it? Um, and then as they start to build that into their process, it will start to become second nature. Um, and you know, you have phones now, almost everybody gets a, a phone. You can show them the ability to, you don't actually have to type in, you just hit this button and you record your voice and you say what's on the image and out the door it goes. So that might also be um, a way to do it. But yeah, leadership buy-in is always really hard unless you throw money at them because they know what the budget is. They know what bad headlines are. But your actual team is always tough. And so with me still being new in my current role, when I get done, I'm actually going to send this presentation over to my team. And I'm going to say, watch this. And then we'll come have a conversation about what we're going to do to move forward. So it, it, is, it is tough. Start small. This isn't a huge lift. But we do need to make sure that we're adhering to the law, but we're, we're reaching our entire community. All right. Well, thank you guys. You are a great audience and great questions. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. All right, well, thanks, everyone. Now, when you get back and talk to your supervisors and tell them about all the great stuff you learned, don't get back and say, how was the conference? And be like, eh, it was all right. <laughs> tell, tell them you had a great time. You got tons of stuff to bring back. And we will see all of you next year in Indy. So thank you. Safe travels, everyone, and thank you.